DC, thank you. Thank you. My name is D.C. Padgett. I've been keeping bees since October. I've got my first colony. And I've really been looking into trying to raise queens for several months. And I actually took the first step yesterday. I've got two nukes in my backyard. I'm setting for queen uh, starter colonies. And I put a comb of just a piece of raw comb in a colony yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon. Marked it. So four days from yesterday, I'm going to pull that comb out. I should have eggs in there ready to go. So if all goes well, 25 days from today, I'm looking to have some queens. We'll see what happens. Right. So today's talk is about bee reproduction, and I want to give credit to where my sources were. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Ellis, Lawrence Connor, Nico and Gudrid Koeniger, those are the primary sources. I also got some information from Michael Palmer and Michael Bush. Uh, I don't think these guys are doctors, but this, these two guys have been keeping bees for like 30 and 40 years each. And they got lots of information. They've both got websites. They've both got YouTube videos. A lot of neat stuff going on. So, we think about bee reproduction, typically we think about the queen goes in a cell and she lays an egg and it grows into a bee and they, they keep doing this. But that's really not bee reproduction, that's, that's actually bee colony maintenance. It's kind of like your body building muscle tissue or skin cells. Because your bee colony, although each individual bee is an individual, the colony is a superorganism and the colony itself is an individual. So when we think about bee reproduction, we're actually thinking about not making more bees, but making more colonies of bees. So when your colony wants to make, a, make another colony, it gets into this attitude of swarming. And when a bee colony swarms, that's actually reproduction. So if you see a colony swarm, you're seeing a colony give birth. And so what we're trying to do is when we, try, when we try to stop swarming, we're practicing bee birth control. We're planned parenting, okay? That's what we're doing here. So we see, we see several stages when a colony is fixing to, to try to reproduce. And one of the first things you're going to see is drone production. Now typically in the winter time, sometime between mid-November and December, you're going to see drone population drop down to nothing. And then you're going to see it pick back up again. Sometime end of January, early February, you're going to see drone pick up. And what's going to ha probably happen is you're going to go in your, in your beehive one day, there's no drones. You come in a week later, all of a sudden half of a frame is loaded up with drone cells. Because certain conditions have changed, the colony's got an attitude they want to reproduce, they're making drones. They have to have drones, because you've got to have males and females to reproduce. So the colony's going to start out by making drones. You can try to stop them from making drones, and you can't do it. Try to stop teenagers, okay? You can't do it. Right? They're going to make drones. Don't worry too much about making drones anyway, because it's a natural thing, so they're going to make some. Yeah, the one thing you do want to watch out for, though, is we had an instance in one of the hives here at the, at the strawberry field. If they make so many drones that they put a, a tax on the supplies in the hive, your hive can run out of honey real fast. And your, your colony can produce anywhere from 5 to 7% drones over the brood. So if you've got a good, strong colony with, say, 40,000 bees, all of a sudden you add another 4,000 drones, and the drones can eat more honey than your, than your workers do anyway. So your, your supplies can come down pretty quick. So as, you know, as bee husbandsmen, as beekeepers, and and stewards, we want to be, pay attention to what's going on in the colony. You go in there and there's a lighter drone, your honey supplies are going down, we need to add feed. So it all starts with an egg. Right? The queen's only job in a beehive is to go through the hive, stick her head in the cell, figure out what kind of egg she's going to stick in there, and she turns around, puts her butt in there, drops in an egg. And it depends upon the size of the cell. Your typical cell size for standard cells is about five millimeters from across the flats. A drone cell is bigger, it's about six and a half millimeters. So the queen's going to stick her head in the cell, see if it's clean. She's going to feel the inside of the cell, see how big it is. If it's a small cell, she'll drop in an egg, she'll fertilize it, it becomes a worker. If it's a large cell, she's going to drop in an egg, she will not fertilize it, and that becomes a drone. An uh, interesting concept in bees is an unfertilized egg becomes a drone. So a drone bee does not have a father. Kind of weird. Right. It does have a grandfather. And, and what's interesting is if you trace the, the paternal line back on a, on a bee, drone bee, you end up with a Fibonacci sequence. The number of, of fathers and grandfathers. Well, it's kind of weird, you know? Nature does some strange stuff. All right. Every egg starts at royal jelly. So the queen's going to come up to the cell. She dumps in an egg. The next thing that happens is a worker bee comes behind her and puts in a big gob of royal jelly on top of the egg. It happens to every single egg. Right. It's going to stay an egg for three and a half days, at which time it's going to become a larva. And the larva's going to start eating the royal jelly. Now, if it's going to be a worker bee or a drone, they're going to feed it bee bread. And the bee bread is slightly different between the two. If for some reason the colony is trying to make another queen, it's different. The queen is exclusively fled oil jelly from the time it's an egg until the time they cap it. 
And when it comes out, it's still fed royal jelly for its entire life, although it's also fed honey in other supplements. But the queen bee is fed royal jelly for her entire lifetime. Alright, I already got that in there. Now, queen cells are vertical. Now, I'm trying to get a definitive answer on why this happens, and nobody's been able to tell me this for certain yet. We know that the queen cell has to be vertical, and we can manipulate bee colonies to create queens because we know this. Uh, the best answer I've gotten so far is queen cells can be up to two and a half times longer than a standard cell. So if you ran a queen cell horizontally in a colony in a tight frame, you'd end up with that tip of that cell going through the next into the next frame. She may be able to dig herself out of there. So they make them vertical, and it gives her more room to get out. Sounds logical. I, have, I, sent a, I sent an email to Jamie, hasn't got back to me. So for right now, I'm going to accept that. There could be some physiological thing, but I listened to one of the lectures that Jamie did, and according to what he says, as long you can take a a egg that's been that's become a worker and you feed it um, hormones, youth hormones, and it'll become a queen. So regardless of the orientation of it, so it's I think the orientation is simply because it's bigger and it has to be longer. So they've, they've taken care of that for themselves. All right, here's a here's a frame with a bunch of different cells and things on it. Letter A. We have a larva in the cell, and judging by the size of that larva, I'd say it's probably about six or seven days old. Uh, larva is going to get capped to eight or nine days, and it's not capped, so probably six or seven days old. Letter B, you have a queen cell sticking down vertical. Um, Letter C, we have drone cells. Drone cells will stick out. they got a dome in the front because your drone is quite a bit bigger than your, than your standard worker. And over here in letter D, there's an egg. People say eggs look like tiny grains of rice. They look like really, really tiny grains of rice, okay? And for me, I've got to put magnifying glasses on to see it because I just can't see it. All right, so drone development. Drones are for a different type of bee bread. I talked about that earlier. When the drone is developing as a larvae, as testicles and sperm develop at that stage. And the drone will develop anywhere between 5 and 10 million, or can develop between 5 and 10 million sperm. And nutrition is a key factor here. And again, we talked about earlier, you get into your colony and you find out that you got you know, 3,000 drones in there, but there's no honey or pollen. You might end up with sterile drones. Because if they're not fed at this stage, critical stage, they're not going to produce the sperm you want. So I mean, if you're going to have, if you're going to have 5,000 drones, you may have 5,000 drones with 10 million sperm cells each. You know, it's better off than having 5,000 drones with no sperm at all. So you got to be able to reproduce. Very important to have nutrition. When the sperm matures. At, at day eight or nine, the larva is going to turn into a pupa. When it turns into a pupa, the sperm matures. The bee will create no more sperm cells at that point. It creates a modern larva stage. It develops heads and tails at that point. And the bee will fully mature. So these are bees. The worker is the first one, the smallest of the three. She develops in 21 days from the time from the egg to the, where she crawls out of the cell. The drone takes 24 days, probably because it's larger. And, and the queen actually comes out in 16 days. And there's two theories on this. One is because the, the colony needs a queen. When you need a queen, you got to have a queen because she's vital to the colony. Other theory is because she's fed a really high protein, very rich food source for the first nine days of her life that she develops faster. In fact, if you listen to some of the some of the different um, lectures on how to breed queens, they talk about you want you want a colony when you're bu building a breeding nuke or a uh, a cell starter. You want to have as many nurse bees in there as you possibly can. So when they start building queens, they just pack the cups full of royal jelly. And the objective is that when the queen comes out, you go back and look in that cup, and there's still uneaten royal jelly inside the cup. So she's been well nourished the whole time. And because of that high protein diet, she can develop faster. All right, so this is the inside of a drone, his, his sex organs. Now, once, once a drone comes out of the cell, the only thing he's doing, he's walking around the colony, and he's eating honey and pollen. Right? He's really not producing anything. But there is something important that he is doing, and I got this from Dr. Lawrence Connor. He's migrating sperm. Because the sperm starts off in his testes, it has to travel through the seminal vesicles, and down in here to the ejaculatory duct and the bulb. Now, also, you have to understand that this is inside out, inside of the male bee. Right? And what, what Dr. Lawrence says is, it has to migrate down because when he engages with the queen, they have to be ready for what he calls rapid deployment. Because the engagement with the queen is extremely short, very fast. So this is inside of the drone. And it's called an endophallus because it's inside. All right, this is extended. Uh, if you watched the video, we did an extraction a couple weeks ago. Um, we took a couple dead drones. And if you take a dead drone, please don't do this with a live drone. If you take a dead drone and you squeeze his thorax with enough pressure, you can raise the pressure in his body sufficient to make his endophallus come out and you see what it looks like. 
So here's a graphic of it. Two, two items with several in significance. You see the semen and the mucus there is on top. So remember, this was inside out a moment ago. So if that was like a balloon, it was inside the balloon, and when it's fully everted or inflated, for lack of a better term, it's actually already on the tip, so it doesn't have to move. There are two horns, cornua. The purpose of that is when he, when he engages with the queen and his endophallus is enlarged, those hooks actually engage her body and maintain contact for the entire event. And, and even past the event. And we'll talk about that later. And lastly, there's a section here that calls a clasper. It's a hairy patch. And that hairy patch has a significance not for that drone, but for the drone that's coming up behind him. So remember that. All right, and this is the endophallus of a bee that's been squeezed to make it pop out. All right, so the next thing we need is queens. We've got drones. We've got you know, 5,000 drones running around our hive. Now we've got to get queens so they can get made with the drones. So queen cups are placed in a cell. Now there's a lot of, lot of wise tales, a lot of folklore about supersedure cells and swarm cells and all kinds of different queen cells. And it's bogus, okay? I'm going to explain to you why cells are where they're at right now today. You find the whole thing. Queen cups are the first thing you see. These are queen cups. Typically, you're going to see queen cups in your colonies on the bottom of a frame or the sides of a frame. The reason for that is it's a convenient place for the bees to put a cup because typically there's nothing going on in the bottom of the frame. There's nothing going on in the sides of the frame. When you get in your colonies and you pull them out, you're going to find brood patterns in the middle. You're going to find honey across the top. You're going to find pollen down the edges. On the outside edges and on the bottom, there's nothing there. That's a convenient place for a bee to put a cup. Bees are just like us. They're lazy, okay? They're going to put stuff where it's easy to put it. So you're going to find queen cups in a place where it's easy to put. There's one that's on the bottom. Here's one up here on the top side. Right. These are queen cups. You can find queen cups in your colony any time of the year. It doesn't mean your bees are leaving you. All it means is that some workers in the colony haven't smelled the queen's pheromones for a while and they think something might have happened. So they're panicking and they make a queen cup. If she puts an egg in here, because it's vertically oriented, they're going to treat it like a queen and make a queen. If she comes by and says, I, I'm, I'm, pay, I'm paying attention to this thing, it'll leave it. It's no big deal. Now, some people, when they find queen cups in their colonies, they'll cut them out. Uh, it's up to you. You can cut them out or not. If they really want to make queens, you're not going to stop them, but you can go ahead and cut them out. These are queen cells. Now, these particular cells I know are emergency queen cells. And the reason I know this is because that's my frame. <laughs> I took this frame from one of the colonies here. It had open larvae and eggs on it. And I took another frame, which had some pollen and some honey on it, and stuck them in a nuke box, took it to the house for the, for the whole purpose to see if they would make queens and become a colony. And two days later, I opened it up here. I got three queens. Actually, there's four. There's one on the bottom you can't see from this picture. But there were three queens there and one on the bottom. So those are emergency cells. And I'll, I'll explain why they put them there in, in a few moments. All right. These are queen cells made by a commercial queen breeder. There's 45 queen cups or queen cells in this frame. And again, we've, we've manipulated the fact that we know that if you take a colony that does not have a queen and you give them queen cells, eggs that are three and a half days to five days old, if it's more than five days old, they won't mess with it. If it's less than three and a half days old, they won't mess with it. You've got a day and a half window in there. So you give them cells that are three and a half to five days old, put them in the thing vertically. If, if you've got enough bees in the colony and they're queenless, they're going to jump on and they're going to turn them into queens. So this is what I hope to happen to me on Saturday. I'm going to put 15 cups in there and see what they do. Right, this is a brood pattern. This is a wonderful looking brood pattern. This is a good example of what the queen does. This is probably a, a medium or a, a deep frame. Now, on a standard frame, standard deep frame, there is slightly over 7,000 cells. Okay. So, judging by the brood pattern here, I'm going to say there's 3,500 cells she's filled here. It's a great pattern. You get a couple empty cells. A couple empty cells are okay. A couple different reasons for that. There could have been some, some uh, small high beetles in there. Could have been an inbred problem. Uh, one of the unique things with bees is if for some reason a queen should mate with one of her own drones, when it develops into a pupae, it's only got one set of chromosomes. So it's got two pairs. It's all, they're all the same. The worker bees can detect that. That's a... Uh, a um, inbred drone and it'll yank it out and kill it. So if you get into your colony and you find patterns where you've got lots of cells in different areas that are pulled out, it's typically they call it hygienic behavior, and it's, it's a good sign that you've got an inbred queen. Uh, also, uh, someone said inbred queens, all they want to do is die, so it can really cause problems with your colony. But what happens with a with queen when she's laying eggs is she lays in a spiral pattern which kind of looks like a fat football. So she'll, so she'll start in the middle of the frame and she'll work her way out. Now, 
Judging by the size of this pattern, things say 3,500 bees, your queens can lay 2,000 eggs a day, but typically they don't. Typically you're going to see a queen laying somewhere between 800 and 1,100 eggs in a day. So let's say she laid 1,000 eggs a day. It would take her three and a half days to lay this brood pattern. So let's back up a week, because these are all capped at least nine days old. Let's back up a week. She just finished laying eggs on the top of that pattern. You went in your hive to check it, and when you put the frame back in, you squished your queen. Because 95% of the time when a queen dies is because we killed her. So now, you got a queenless beehive, and they've got to make a queen from an egg that is three and a half to five days old. So they come over here on this frame, and you've got all these eggs here are three and a half days old. So where are they going to put a queen cell? They're going to put a queen cell right there. Because that's the convenient place to put it. It has nothing to do with super procedure. It has nothing to do with swarming. It has to do with where they found an egg that's three and a half to five days old. So if she came in here and laid these, and before she got to the outside she died, they'd come down here and put a queen cell right there. So the location of your queen cell really doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the, what the hive is trying to do. It has to do with what the hive had to work with. Now, we need to look at the population of the, of the colony to find what they're trying to do. If you open up your colony and it's just packed jam full of bees and you find queen cells, okay, they're going to swarm. Not because you found queen cells, they're going to swarm because they can't move. They're full of stuff. And next month we'll talk about birth control, what we can do to try to stop swarming. Alright, so once the queen is born, and this is also an interesting concept, once the queen is born, the virgin queen is born, the first thing she's going to do is run around the colony, and she's going to find any other queens that haven't been born yet, she's going to chew a hole in the side of their, their cells, and she's going to kill them. Because right? the virgin queens, for some reason, virgin queens will fight and kill each other. Maybe the queens will not. And there was an experiment, I listened to a lecture by Michael Bush, he said, uh, guy that runs bee source, can't leave his name, conducted an experiment one time, took a whole bunch of mated queens, stuck them in a box together, see if they fight to the death, they ran away from each other. They wanted them to do with each other. Mated, mated queens don't care. And you can take mated queens and virgin queens, put them together, they don't care. But virgin queens together, they go fight. So, it's really kind of strange. And Stuart and I actually saw on one of his colonies about two weeks ago, had two queens. It is possible. Uh, the bee college, they told us that at any given time, up to 10% of your colonies can have two queens going. Typically when that happens, it's a mother-daughter situation. A virgin queen came out, she may have made it and started laying, the mother's still laying, uh, the colony's still going to go that way, but eventually you'll end up with one queen. So the queen came out, and now you've got a queen. But she doesn't really look like this. She looks more like this. That's what a queen looks like. So the next thing we got to do is, we got to get the queen mated. Now what she's going to do when she comes out, she's going to run around the colony anywhere from three days to a week, which can frustrate people because, you know, our beekeepers, we want to see eggs in our beehives. You know, and we, there's no eggs, we get worried, you know, what's going on, what's going on, and you get really anxious. Well, some, there's a lot of different factors involved. The, the, the queen's going to wait, maybe she couldn't find a drone, something else is going on. The earliest they say they found eggs after a queen emerges is eight days. Typically, it's like 16 days. So, and your queen cell is open. 16 days later, look for eggs. So, she's going to fly out. She's going to find drones. And this is interesting. Dr drones go to places called drone congregation areas, DCAs. And what's neat about this is that your colony's got 5,000 drones and one queen. So, you've got to save resources. So, your 5,000 drones are going to fly out, but they're going to stay within a mile. And some, some people say within one kilometer of the colony. They're going to find a DCA. Whereas the queen, she's going to fly out at least a mile and a half to three miles. And by doing this, it avoids inbreeding. And they do it by themselves. She'll go someplace where her drones typically don't go. You still get inbreeding at times, but she's going to fly farther out. And it's just a, just a basic resource type thing. Because your drones are bigger, they take more fuel to fly. They use up more honey and pollen. Whereas you got one small queen, she's not using any resources, she can fly farther. And she's going to fly one or two times, whereas your drones are going to fly every day until they die. Or maybe the queen, which is going to die, either way. <laughs> All right, the main flight, the video, I'll get the video up, we'll do the video in a little bit, because I can't get to play with this thing. But we'll talk about what happens afterwards. After the queen mates with anywhere from 10 to 20 drones in one evening, and each, mate, each mating uh, sequence takes just a couple seconds. She's going to come back to the colony with the mating symbol. And what happens when she mates is, all, all the semen she collects from all the drones she mates with is going to get stuck in these oviducts. It's going to swell her up. And, we, and they believe that's what, that's what triggers her to stop mating. When her oviducts are swollen, and she feels that she's well-mated, she's going to go back to the colony. And over the course of the next one to three days, 
and she's moving around the colony, all the sperm she collected from all these donors is going to intermingle and mix around, and it's going to migrate up into this gland here called the spermatheca, which is really a remarkable gland. This gland can hold approximately 5 million sperm. Now, we talked earlier that our drones can have up to 10 million sperm. So she can get enough sperm from a single mating to fill up spermatheca and she'll last her her lifetime. But because she's mating with you know, multiple drones and sitting in her, in her oviducts for several days migrating, she's going to bring sperm up from all the different donors. And another neat thing is because it's got to go up the tube, dead sperm can't swim, they can't get up into, into the spermatheca. Now, the spermatheca is covered with a network of uh, blood vessels and capillaries, which keep it well oxygenated. And it also has a gland, which I cannot I look for the name, I can't remember the name. It creates some enzyme that we have no idea what it is. But sperm inside this globe, it looks like a crystal ball, can stay viable and alive for up to seven years. Now, we can't keep sperm alive for seven years in a laboratory unless you cryogenically freeze it. Now, they've done laboratory tests on the spermatheca. They've taken it out of a queen. They've tried to, you know, keep blood circulating. They've tried various things. As soon as they take it out of the queen, within hours it all dies. So there's something in her body generating enzymes, oxygenating this thing that keeps the sperm alive for up to seven years. That's all pixelated. All right, we'll try the other video. I edited the video down. If you want to see this video, if you go on YouTube and look up Queen Bee's Wedding Flight, you can find the original video. Oh, here we go. It'll play. I'm going to pause it and we'll come back and look at it again because there's some, there's some key parts in this thing. I have no idea how they got this video. It came from um, the carnage over in Germany. Now, you have a bee flying around in a drone congregation area. And they spotted what, they, what we call a drone comet. Right here you've got several thousand drones. They're flying around DCA and they're all looking for one thing, looking for a queen. And all of a sudden she comes through and her pheromones hit the air. So now you've got 10,000 drones who are trying to fill the same space and they're all going to fly in together there and they form what's called a drone comet. Which would be pretty cool. I'd like to see one of those things sometime. So you got the drone comet. The next thing that's pretty interesting is as the drones come up to her, they're really not paying much attention to what they're doing. And you're going to see two drones crash. They crash and burn pretty good. <laughs> now, now, when the next drone comes up, he's going to bump into her, her abdomen and something's going to happen. As soon as he bumps into her, you notice, whoops, yeah. As soon as he bumped into her, she opened up her sting chamber, so she's ready now to receive the mating from the drone. So he, he's going to fly behind her, wrap his legs around her body, He'll get himself into position. He's going to attract all the muscles in his thorax, which is going to take up to 70% of the hemolymph or the blood in his body. And if you notice, let me back up. If you notice, as soon as he started arching back, his wings stopped moving. Because it takes so much blood to evert the endophallus that he, lo he loses all motor control. So his wings stop moving and he can't hold on. And he's, essentially, he's paralyzed, unconscious. And as, as the... Did they catch where he removes the previous? No, I didn't get that. So right now, the only thing holding them together is the soft tissue, the endophallus. And so gravity and friction finish it off. So when he's mating, well, I'll play the video again when he stops. When he's mating with her, because he can't hold on, he falls backwards. And the forward motion and the friction of the air and the gravity cause the endophallus to rip off. And it stays inside the back of the queen. And they call it the mating sign. We spoke earlier about the hairy patch, and we looked at the one picture. The purpose of that is, on the bottom of the, of the drone's abdomen, there's another hairy patch, and they act like Velcro. So if a drone comes up to a queen that's been previously mated, and she has a mating sign, he just matches up the two hairy patches and slide backwards. It pulls out the previous endophallus, and by doing so, it puts him in the exact position to mate with the queen. And they found that it's easier for subsequent drones to mate because when they remove the first mating sign, it's, it puts them in a better position to line up so that they can mate with the queen. And we'll play this again without any stops.
that's why it really stinks to be a drone, because you, you let your mate once and you instantly die. Right. Does anybody have any questions? I can hear it too. Yeah. Now, if you, if you go on Google or in any internet search and you look up, you know, reasons why this happens, you're going to find a lot of bogus stuff. I know one place says that the, the ejaculation is it was so, so much force that his testicles explode. His testicles are still inside his body, okay? It's, it's not what happens. It's, it's gravity. It's, it's simple physics. It's gravity. The soft tissue can't maintain the contact. That's what causes it to break off. Yeah. I got a question. Go ahead. You, you had that one picture there with the uh, uh, five there. The brew powder? Yes. And you said if you happen to crush, crush the queen or kill the queen accidentally, they're going to look for a cell that's, you know... Three and, a, three and a half to five days old, yes. But they're not vertical cells in that. No, okay, that's a good question. What they'll do is, and, um... Change it? Yeah, I can, let, me, let me go back to your picture, because there's a couple different things that they can do. Um, let me go back to my PowerPoint here. Let me show you two different slides. Where's play it? Huh? I'll just go. I'll do it this way. Right, here's here's one example I'm going to show you. There's a queen cell that's actually drawn on the face of a comb. Right. And I'll explain what, what the difference between this one and the other one in a moment. That's, that's the queen. It's, it's actually drawn, if you, were, if you look sideways to the comb, it's actually pulled out from the comb and coming down the front. As compared to... Uh, let me find the other one. This one here. These are more of an angle coming out. The reason for this is, this is a fairly new, new comb frame, and the cells are soft. So the bees will do in a soft cell, they'll go in there and they'll chew the bottom wall of the comb out. Because it's easier for them to kind of chew the bottom wall of the comb out and get back and then it'll come out of the diagonal. Um, whereas if it's an older frame, harder comb, that, again, they're lazy like us. They don't want to have to chew this thing out. So if it's, if it's a real hard, older comb, what they'll do is they'll pump that cell full of royal jelly and they'll float the egg out to the surface and they'll draw a cell right down the face of it and they'll put a queen cell there. There's no queen to lay a new egg, so no, they're going to take the, one of those... Grown or worker cells and, and, and sort of reconfigure it. Right. It's got, it has to be an egg, three and a half. To, it has to be a fertilized egg, so it has to be a worker egg. And it's got to be between three and a half and five days old. And I think the reason for the three and a half to five days is because you know once the egg emerges into a into a, um, a larva, it's going to start eating that royal jelly. And it's not going to take long because all you get you know they get one gob of royal jelly when the egg comes in there. And it won't take them long to eat that royal jelly. And once that royal jelly is gone. You've got that gap in the nutrition cycle, and it's going to mess things up. So you got to get it. You got to give them good nutrition. Why well, can't be less than three and a half days? It's, it's still an egg. Your egg actually comes out. It's an egg between three and three and a half days. That's when the egg breaks out into a, into a larva, and you got to get it in larva stage. Uh, I know I've, I've listened to some people. They say you can graft eggs when you're taking a chance because when you, when you move the egg, it may not actually develop into a larva. So you're looking for that. I mean, the best time is um, Michael. Um, He says three days plus 12 hours is what he's looking for. That's what he wants to graft at. Three plus 12 hours. That's your op optimum time. Yeah, actually, well, they, they're trying to do research on that now. What, what I was told at Bee College is if you look at the tree line of the horizon and you find a place that dips like a valley, typically that's where you find DCAs, drone congregation areas. If you're curious and you want to find one, what you can do is get a kite or a hot air balloon or a helium balloon and find somebody with, some, with a queen pheromone strip, stick it in a, a pill bottle or a, or a Coke bottle, and walk around with it. Now, if you're in a DCA and they smell that thing, your pill bottle is going to fill up with drones. And then you can look at the drones and see what they look like. You know, if they look like healthy drones or you've got deformed wings, you know, you, there may be a problem there. But they, um, a lot of different universities, I know Jamie Ellis, they do that up at the college. They'll walk around and they'll, they'll collect drones so they can take them back to the lab and test them. Do they move the eggs? Do they move the eggs to the location for sale? I, I don't know. I think they can, personally. Now, Dr. Jamie Ellis was doing a lecture. Someone asked him if they move eggs. He said he didn't think so. And I've got a, I've got a beehive over here right now that a week and a half ago, I pulled the frame out and looked as close as I could. Could not find eggs or larvae, anything on this frame. So I took a frame with eggs and larvae from a different hive and stuck it in. Today I've got queen cells on both those frames. And I don't know how, but... You know, so 
Either I missed something, totally, or they moved an egg. I don't know which. There's, there's also theories about the drones being at different altitudes. Yeah, the, there are theories that different different species of drones and bees will made at different altitudes, so you're keeping your species separated. No. Kind of interesting thing there. Part of the integrated pest management is they sometimes beekeepers will say, if you find drone cells that are in a specific area, destroy them so that you can get rid of the mites because they can grow and typically go into the drone cells. How do you feel that changes or is that a, is that a response? Okay. Uh, you gotta have drones. You gotta have males and females to mate. So, and we, our, it depends upon your objective in having bees. And my objective in having bees is I want to make bees. I make lots and lots of bees. So, if I want to make lots of bees. I gotta have drones. Now, I may not need ten thousand drones. Uh, you can go in because rural mites will typically go into a drone drone cell before they go into a worker cell. You could go into your colony at some time and take. They make a fork. You can stick in the top of your drone cells and pop out. Maybe take out, you know, hundred or so drone cells to see if you got varroa mites in there. But no, I wouldn't. You're only going to have drones during certain periods of time. We just had them now because, you know, you had nothing from December, January. All of a sudden you got warmer weather, you got more sunlight, you got honey, you got nectar. All these things are going on and the, the colony wants to expand, so the queen's going to start laying drones. We'll see drone populations drop down. It's not going to go to nothing. I mean, we've already seen it uh, in, in all my highs that the number of drone cells have dropped way down. So they're going to drop way down. But again, we monitor these things. Uh, I always say you should be in your hive like every 10 days. Uh, if you listen to college, you be in your hive every 9 days. Because right? I'm, I'm not sure what the difference is. You know. you, you got to be in your beehives on a regular basis. There was a time in our, in our history where you could put a colony in your backyard and check it once a year. We can't do that now. There's, there's too many pests and predators out there that are coming to attack our bees. we got to be there every week. Why do they make the drone stuff? It's bigger. Well, yeah, it's bigger. It's more food. Okay. Yeah. It's also lasts longer. Yeah. That's one of the theories. Why? Why? Why would the mites go for the drones instead of the workers? And that's, what, that's why some people actually there's a, a foundation now that they make where the cells are just a micro. Uh, I don't know what the measurement is, but smaller than the standard. Six point. What is it? Six point three. It's about. It's drones. So, yeah, so it's the, green too. The foundation that you buy, drone cell foundation, is colored right, green, yeah. so you know <coughs> what it is. And people typically put one in a one frame in, and that's their drone frame, and that's their gorilla mite frame. And that suggests when it gets full of full of drones, that you pull it out, take it in the house, put it in the freezer for a couple of days. Don't touch it. Just put it in the freezer. Take it out. Put it back in your hive. And yeah. The happy bees will go and clean all the dead, dead gorilla mites and the dead drones out of the thing, and the cycle will start all over again. But is it responsible given the fact that you want to drone pollination right. instead right. of to kill all the drones in your But I guess there any of them keeps you sell because you get rid of the mites. So that's true. I have one of those green frames, and I'm trying to, as an experiment, I want, but they also have, what I was talking about, is they have a, a foundation now with the cells are... are just a little bit smaller than, than the worker cells, and the theory is that if, if it makes it smaller and really tight, that the varroa mite will only even have a space to be in there. I will address that because it's green cells are, are bigger. Bigger. <laughs> your typical your typical beast. Your typical cell is about five millimeters, and your drone cell is about six and a half. Now, some people make smaller cells. You can get you can get cells at that four point six. And there's they're across the flats on the flats. Now, there's been experiments done in the last 10, 15 years where they've made small, really small cells, and people have tried giving bees only small cells to try to stop them from making drones. And what the bees will do is, they want drones, okay? Like, it's teenagers having sex, it's not gonna happen. What they'll do is on that frame you stuck in there with the wax foundation, they'll lay wax across the face of it, make it flat, and they'll draw six and a half millimeter cells on top of the wax. So now you're still gonna have drones, but instead of having drones that stick out three eighths of an inch, now your drones are sticking out five eighths of an inch because they built frame. You're not gonna stop them. It's nature, everything, everything wants to reproduce, your bees wanna reproduce. But, yes? They know what the hive needs. They know right. what the requirements are of the hive. They know what drones possibly need to be made, what to be made. They know more than we know. We think that they need to be made. So, you know, you don't have to manage down to as much or manage your drones. This is the problem 
videos you should watch. There's, if you if you have Netflix, there's a Netflix movie called More Than Honey. It's a documentary on essentially what commercial beekeeping is doing to bees. You ought to watch it because it's, in fact that that excerpt with the mating flight came from that. It's called More Than Honey. Really good. It talks about the fact that from January February time frame, about 85 percent of all commercial bees are out in California pollinating almonds. And they're all sharing all the same diseases and, and bacteria. And then when that's done, they take off and travel across the rest of the United States and migrate all those bacteria and disease across the United States. So it's, it's really good to watch that. Um, yeah. yeah, there's some good ones out there. Any other questions? Informative stuff? Cool. Wow. Hey, that was a big climax to the meeting. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'm glad there's no kids here tonight, aren't you? Okay, this concludes the formal part of the meeting. Now, here's why we do it. We try to end right at, right at 8 o'clock. Here's why. Because we want you to spend as much time talking to each other, asking questions, looking at equipment, talking about the different things that you see here. Um, by the way, DC, show, be sure and uh, people have questions about those hive fingers. The greatest invention in, in beekeeping in the last 100 years. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, again, thank you all very much for, for your attendance tonight. I hope that you've learned something. I hope that you've uh, gotten excited and motivated and, and thrilled about about uh, beekeeping um, tell your friends about it we're here every we here Tuesday night if you have some kind of a, an invention or, or device or anything like that what we want to do is want to this is about us it's not about any pre people that speak this is about everybody so if you have some inventions or if you have some ideas or input or if you've read a really good article and you'd like to share a part of that that's how we, that's how we do our meetings we kind of break it up into 10 minute sections uh, before the before the main lecture like that so anyway DC Kirk thank you guys tonight very much for your presentations um,